say that psychologists study their own deficiencies. <laughs> I studied forgetting. I uh, have always had a terrible memory and desperately wanted and imagined that it might be possible to improve at, and to, to learn in a more effective way. So that's the core behind everything that we're going to be talking about. And at the same time, I want to try and relate it to some of the learning platforms that you're all very familiar with. Um, I should say that I'm not an expert on some of the current learning technologies, so I'm hoping to learn as much about that from you as, as vice versa. Um, uh, I always like to start all of my presentations with a humorous equation. Um, I've skipped it for today, but if anybody would like to hear some equation jokes at the end, I'd be happy to. Uh, please don't take me up on that. Um, so I think the uh, first thing I want to tell you a little bit about um, is me, and then we'll talk more about the ideas. So I trained at Princeton putting people in brain scanners and applying machine learning to try and read their minds in an attempt to understand why we forget things. Uh, it was enormous fun and very stimulating, and it led to a series of happy developments. I co-founded Memrise, uh, which is the second largest language learning app in the world, um, after Duolingo, um, after grad school uh, with Ed Cook. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that has uh, informed uh, my thinking. The um, other bits and bobs, I helped The Guardian build up their data warehouse. Um, I'm currently the chief data scientist at Channel 4. And I also want to just, in the interest of full disclosure, say that I'm a board advisor for Filtered, who are exhibiting here. And so I'm going to mention them once in the talk. I just want to give that kind of caveat that I have a vested interest, because I think they're super. Um, by the way, please interrupt, um, jump in. Let's make this um, much more positive than that experience. But uh, questions, suggestions, uh, criticisms, uh, all very, very welcome. Um, so let me start by telling you about Ed Cook, uh, my co-founder. Uh, this is Ed in the process of memorizing a deck of cards, which he can do in under a minute flat. He's a grand master of memory, and that's an official title that requires you to do a series of kind of memory obstacle courses. Um, Ed came to crash on my couch for a couple of days one summer at Princeton, and then um, didn't leave for three months. Uh, and in the process, completely derailed my PhD thesis. But an enormously generative and happy time, and a lot of ideas came out of that. So the first um, was a story that he told me about uh, the ancient Greeks. Uh, indeed, a poet called Simonides of Chaos, and uh, Simonides decided to throw a party. I couldn't find a, a picture of an ancient Greek villa, so this is my, a photo of my dining room. Um, and so in the middle of the party, uh, he got interrupted. I don't know if he received a text message or someone knocked on the door. But anyway, he went outside in the middle of his own party. And while he was there, the entire roof of his villa uh, collapsed on all the guests, uh, burying and killing all of them, except Simonides himself. Uh, he was the world's worst party host. And uh, because the Greeks cared a great deal about burial, they were trying to identify everyone's remains. And I don't know if you've ever, for instance, tried to say, OK, hang on, let me just list every single person who was at the party last night. It's incredibly difficult to do. What Simonides discovered was that if he actually thought about where each of them were sitting, and so went round the table in order spatially, he could actually recall where every single person was sitting, and therefore give a complete guest list. It's really, really interesting how much more effective that approach is than simply trying to close your eyes and think. Now, we can ask, why is it that that method, now known as the method of loci, that is to say, arranging objects in space in your mind as a way of recalling them all, and indeed, recalling them in order. In fact, it's quite cool. You could even recall them in reverse order if you traverse the space backwards. And so Simonides was the first person to discover the method of loci. Um, and I remember Ed telling me the story because Indeed, it is the sort of at the core of um, literally almost all of the memory techniques that international competitive memorizers use. Um, so uh, in terms of news you can use, if you ever have to memorize a speech and you don't have slides and you don't want to use um, notes, the easiest way to do it is to imagine each slide or each um, chapter or each piece of your speech as some kind of object. Pick a space you know really well, so uh, say your bedroom, 
And then imagine in your mind placing each object in space in your bedroom and then move through your bedroom in a prescribed order. So for instance, for this talk, I might uh, start with, um, you know, I'd imagine the little man with a uh, um, piece of chalk and I'd place him on my bedside table and then I might have, you know, Ed sitting on my bookshelf and then I might have um, all of the various slides arrayed and I just progress around my bedroom. Okay, so that's the kind of core of the idea of the method of loci, and without joking, it can improve the, um, uh, the retention, uh, how, how quickly and how well you learn things by you know, multiple factors, um, as well as being quite good fun once you get the hang of it. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about why that works so well, talk through some examples of where it works well, and more generally, how we might apply this in technology. Okay. So uh, Ed and I sat down together after that, and we thought, well, hang on, well, if we put our heads together, uh, and we decided we'd start with Mandarin, because we thought that's the holy grail of really difficult things to learn. Um, actually, neither of us spoke Chinese. Perhaps it was a bit of an audacious thing to attempt anyway. But, um, uh, and, and so our goal was to enable people to learn both incredibly quickly and have enormous fun to build ridiculously effective and thoroughly engaging learning experiences. Uh, and this is not going to turn into a pitch about memorize. This is really about the ideas. This just happens to be the best way I know of illustrating the examples. So let's start with this particular problem. Imagine you're in downtown Beijing, and you have an urgent need for the bathroom. And this, this is what you're faced with. Which door are you going to go through? Well, fortunately, you've been using memorize and or indeed uh, attended this talk. And so you're not going to have any trouble in 30 seconds. And let me show you why. So let's start with um, the word for woman. Um, so there you can see it up the top. And we're going to use a mnemonic that makes that really stick in your head. So whenever you see the Mandarin character for woman, you're going to imagine the sort of dancing, scrawny, Quentin Blakey ballerina. Um, and I'm also going to teach you, I'm going to teach you four words today in rapid fire, just to give you a sense of what this feels like. So imagine we're now trying to learn the word for strength. Uh, so here we've got sort of gigantic bodybuilder, like you know, flexing. OK, great. So we've got strength. All right, good. Um, now let's just quickly remember, does anybody want to shout out which is the word for woman? One, two, three, or four? Brilliant. OK, great. Um, and happy days, a little bit of a reward. OK, field. So if you imagine, I don't know, a paddy field or a farmer's field and a, a particularly kind of um, a farmer with a bit of OCD, so he's got everything in a perfect square. OK, great. So we've got field. Fantastic. Now, the interesting thing about Mandarin is it often uses uh, compounds of these kind of core characters. So the word for male, and now we're getting to the payoff, is a kind of compound of strength and field. So I invite you to picture this particularly butch farmer um, as a way of remembering that male is strength plus field. OK, so far so good. Um, and so what's this character for? Brilliant, thank you. Um, and so. Um, we're going to unpack this over the course of the next few minutes, but there's a few things going on. Firstly, there's vivid mnemonics, and I'll uh, include a bunch of references later if anybody wants to follow up the evidence for uh, everything I'm saying today, I hope is strongly, I, I uh, have intended to make sure it's strongly evidence-based uh, and will include references. So um, vivid mnemonics, triple your attention right there. Um, Choreograph testing, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by that in a second. Really important, doubles your attention. And scheduled reminders, that is to say, being reminded at the right moment also doubles. So together, collectively, we were aiming to, uh, uh, these methods can improve the rate at which people learn by a factor of 10. And we have both uh, anecdotal and uh, theoretical uh, and empirical evidence to suggest that this is indeed true. Um, and you can feel it, right? You can feel that you're remembering more effectively. OK, so apologies, Mac, PC, blah, blah. Um, so um, a really good mnemonic, a mnemonic is like a sort of piece of scaffolding for your memory, right? A really good mnemonic is, uh, is vivid. It's interesting. And there's lots of ways to make things vivid and interesting. If you can make them be sexual or violent or funny or intense, like all of those things are things that your brain loves. So let's try and do as much of that as possible while staying sort of safe for work. Um, and um, yeah, blah, blah, references. Uh, so I'll, if you uh, contact me afterwards through LinkedIn, I'll happily share these slides. Um, 
Now, here's the thing about mnemonics. I've given you a couple of examples of them, but they can take many forms. And however clever we are, the world is cleverer than any sort of individual. So one of the things we attempted to do was to crowdsource all of the mnemonics for all of the languages in all the world. Um, and so let's just give you a sense of what some of those look like to give you a sense of how to make things memorable. Um, so here we have um, an example from Brit Princess Number One, who I've never met. Um, uh, she's trying to learn the states of America. So if you look at the top, the capital of Minnesota is St. Paul. You will never forget this again, by the way, because this is St. Paul. St. Paul drinks a mini soda, a small soda. And that's how you remember that St. Paul is the capital of Minnesota. OK. Um, so it, it, we're using sort of it sounds like there's some humor, some obscenity, um, possible risk of causing offense. The white skirt tetra is a tropical fish. Um, so you can uh, think about the four flowing fins, four tetra, some etymology, um, some elaborative encoding. That is to say, forcing you to process and think about the thing that you're trying to learn. So it talks about how the skirt is flowing down the uh, fish. That's basically making you focus on the thing you're trying to learn, form a richer, deeper encoding of it. OK? Um, here, uh, it's from a jazz chord uh, course, so trying to learn the different inter musical intervals. And so if you think about the Jaws theme tune, da, 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 that's a minor second. And uh, so here we're relating the minor second to something you already know, because you already know the Jaws theme tune. OK? Uh, and then finally, understanding is the best mnemonic. Right? So these are all kind of happy party tricks, and they're kind of useful scaffolding. They're like training wheels on your bike. They help you get the memory strong enough that then you can sort of keep practicing it and, and, and internalize it. But um, in some sense, they're gimmicks. Wherever possible, understanding is the best mnemonic. So I'll give you an example. This is a, co a course on Morse code. And uh, it points out that the developers of the Morse code were quite clever. They gave the most common letters in English the shortest codes. And so the um, Morse for the letter E is just a single pip. Because E is the most common letter in the English language, therefore you want that to be the quickest thing that you ever have to type. And indeed, once you think about that, you're never going to forget, as long as you remember that E is the most common letter in the English language, that PIP must be E. OK. So let's talk about scheduling our reminders. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through just a few more principles, and then I'm going to open things up so that we can have a wider discussion. OK, before we do, so schedule reminders. Um, Hands up, by the way, if you've come across the idea of the spacing effect. OK, so about half the room. Great. I'm going to talk about it briefly, and I'm happy to go into way more detail if anyone's interested. So the core idea of the spacing effect, actually, can be, I think, best captured by this. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wonder are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not touched by the frost. Does anybody know where it's from, by the way? Tolkien, uh, Fellowship of the Ring. Um, so, uh, and actually, if you go to Walthamstow, it's written on a bridge for reasons that have never been clear but always been a joy to me. Anyway, so if we focus on these last two lines, the old that is strong that does not wither, deep roots are not reached by the frost, right? The, you know, you can imagine this gigantic oak tree that's been there for 100 years, and you have a sort of slightly cold day, and the oak tree doesn't even notice, right? Whereas you've got some sapling that's only been there for a, a, a week, and that frost could very well kill it off. OK, so memories work a little bit like that. In other words, the longer you have known something, the slower you forget, the slower it decays. And that's why um, if you think about you know, your childhood friend, who uh, you probably knew quite well at the time and has probably only crossed your mind a handful of times in the last 20 years, you still remember their name. You still remember their favorite food. You probably remember their phone number, right? Because these memories, these memories that you've had for a long time are decaying very slowly. Um, and uh, there's a, a graph that everyone tries to draw that I honestly sort of intellectually understand and have never found very helpful, so I'm not going to fixate on it. Instead, I'm going to try and focus on the intuition. And here's the news you can use if you had to boil it down. Let's say you're trying to learn a new uh, word. Um, so we, we learned a bunch before. If I was going to optimize your learning for, say, remembering the Chinese character for woman, and if you think back to it, 
I would remind you after five minutes, then an hour, then a day, then a week, then a month, then a year. In other words, the intervals would be growing. I can't do it exponentially with my arms, but like would be growing exponentially, right? Instead of the same duration of interval each time, they'd be growing exponentially. Uh, you know, minutes, hour, day, week, month, year, decade, right? Indeed, that has a whole bunch of interesting implications. I mean, one of the nice things about learning technologies is they're good at scheduling stuff. They're good at doing all this maths in their head. It's a little bit harder to do this in the real world. Um, but it does mean that, for instance, if you meet a stranger at a party and they tell you their name, I suppose I have two pieces of advice for you. The first is listen, because <laughs> the primary cause of forgetting is that we just weren't paying attention in the first place. Okay. Second thing is, try and at least remind yourself of their name. Either use it, or as you're walking away, just remind yourself of their name. You could, if you were really motivated, think about the people that you met at the party on your way home. That would be a few minutes and then an hour. And that right there will have made a dramatic difference to the likelihood that you'll remember them, if you're motivated to do so. OK. So um, loads of modern learning platforms now incorporate this idea. Um, what you, I promised you uh, ancient Greece, Prussia, and Princeton. OK, so Prussia. This goes back to um, uh, the way this is discovered is actually kind of joyous in a certain way, a very nerdy kind of joy. It goes back to Hermann Ebbinghaus in the late 19th century, who um, was the first person to really get to grips with modern psychology of memory. The way he did this was by making enormous lists of random syllables and learning them himself over the course of you know, hours a day for years, and then rearranging things in different ways to sort of to trace how quickly he forgot them and to d differentiate the circumstances under which things were easier or harder. So he literally memorized like so many thousands of random syllables. And he noticed, he was the first person to notice that his memory decayed in this exponential way and that the nice part was when he reminded himself of something, he learned it faster the second time. And that was the core idea behind the spacing effect. OK. So um, I've made it sound like the spacing effect is easy. Five minutes, hour, day, week, great, happy days. I mean, uh, that's a simplification, but pretty good as an intuition. And I remember the moment I sat down to program in the spacing effect for Memrise. I thought, great. And we had this plan, blah, 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 programmed up. Day later, it was working. I was like, oh. That was, I thought that was going to be really hard, and there, now it's done. It, it was really hard, actually. It wasn't done. It turned out that we were tinkering with that and dealing with all the millions of edge cases that you could start to imagine, if you think about it, for literally months and years. Because the spacing effect turns out to be really tricky. So if there's anybody who wants to hear more, some of the things we could talk about are, well, how often should you introduce new items? Uh, and indeed, uh, let's say someone has been using uh, learning every uh, day for a while and then suddenly goes on holiday for three weeks. The whole spacing effect ordering, I mean, it's all very confusing. And how do you decide how to order things then? And indeed, what if there are multiple different kinds of learning going on at once? And some words are harder than others. Shouldn't that factor in? And some people learn faster. And time of day matters. And whew, motivation. How do you give people a sense of how strong their memories are at a given moment? How do you measure? more accurately than just, yes, they know it, or no, they don't? How do you get a kind of graded sense? So these are all the questions I think modern learning platforms are grappling with. If there's anything here that feels particularly like that grabs you, shout out, and we can go into it in more detail. So let's talk about testing. Um, and indeed, uh, everybody knows that flashcards are a pretty good way to learn. Carry on. Um, why are flashcards so good to, to use? I think the core idea is that practicing remembering, like dredging something up from your recollection, like actively recalling, these are, these are all sort of different ways of saying the same thing. That active recollection is so much more effective as a way of learning than passive recollection. That is to say, just staring at the right answer. So flashcards, by forcing you to look at the question, think about it, try and dredge it up actively, and only then see if you were right, that is a brilliant way to learn. And it's, it's extremely effective. 
So we want to make sure that we aren't simply sort of passively staring at what we think we already know and, oh, yeah, that's familiar. We want to be practicing recalling it. OK. So, um, and there's great evidence for this. It's, it's like, I think at this point, um, very well known. Um, there's a few tricks, actually, to making this work really well. It's tempting when you start learning something to um, uh, stop practicing it once you're getting it right. Actually, it turns out that sort of over-testing yourself, um, over yourself uh, even when you're getting it right, still helps just really solidify, really bed the memory down. Um, there's one interesting gotcha that's worth mentioning but perhaps not dwelling on. It's very tempting to use multiple choice and true-false uh, as a way of testing. Uh, it's, it's, it's tempting for a few reasons. It's really easy to program. It's a really in easy interface to create. You can use it with one hand. It's flexible, so you can test in a whole bunch of different uh, ways. But if you remember what we said a minute ago, practicing recalling something is a really good way of cementing it in your mind. The danger with multiple choice and true-false is if you get the answer wrong, then you risk laying down a really nice false memory. And uh, so the trick, and we're going to talk about this in a second, is to make sure that when you're testing people, you're making it uh, as difficult as possible, uh, but for them to successfully get it right. So there's a sweet spot, and we'll come back to that. Anyway, all I'm trying to say is that the way that you test people makes a difference. Um, and indeed, there's a bunch of other um, interesting gotchas. I'll give you one more example. Um, you know the tip of the tongue phenomenon? Um, there's a lovely experiment where they came up with a bunch of words that tend to um, elicit that tip of the tongue uh, feeling. My favorite was, uh, can anybody shout out the, the, the word for um, that sort of crystal bottle-like thing that you use to store wine and spirits? De de yeah, exactly, decanter. Um, lots and lots of people are like and you're, you're in that tip of the tongue, you can feel it, you're like, oh, it's, it's there, but I can't quite. It's tempting in the face of that frustrating teetering on the edge of uh, uh, memory blossoming, it's tempting to perseverate. And indeed, if you're a kind of type A person, you're probably, oh, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. Actually, there's a lovely study showing that the longer you linger in that kind of uh, forgetful limbo, uh, the, you are slowly actually kind of practicing failing to recall it. You're practicing blocking it, and you actually weaken the memory as a result. It's a small effect, but still kind of cool. So if you're in a tip of the tongue um, moment, then actually your best bet is just do something else, and it'll come back to you, right? Um, and indeed, a lot of the reason that we forget is because other memories get in the way. They interfere. Um, and so the other approach that you can use, if you're really keen to recall it, is to try and come at it from a different angle. So try and think about um, how does it sound. Try and think about examples of you know, decanters you've known and loved. Uh, try and uh, imagine what it would feel like to hold. In other words, if this particular route that you're trying to use to cue the memory is, um, is blocked, is occluded by another memory, then try and come at it from a different angle. Does that make sense? So we talked about the difficulty sweet spot. And indeed, this was a lot of the work that I was doing uh, in grad school. Um, and I suppose, uh, rather than go into it in detail, by the way, this is the third location in our story. So we're now in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, and this is an fMRI machine, so you sort of lie in there and it kind of goes in and then it makes a noise like a kind of gigantic hoover, you know, having sex with an earthquake for an hour um, and, uh, and then you get these lovely brain images. And so what we were trying to do was use machine learning to pick up on the patterns of activity in your brain that were diagnostic of different memories. Uh, so, for instance, our, our brain has evolved an entire system that's really, really good at recognizing faces, making it seem easy to do. Uh, in practice, it's because we've got a supercomputer that's designed to do that entire single task in our Fusiform gyrus, and that's why it seems easy, even though it's hard. Anyway, so we have a bit of our brain that really cares about faces. We have a bit of our brain that really cares about places. We have a bit of our brain that cares a lot about tools. And so we created memories of these different types, and then we used machine learning to tell which, which of those kinds of memories were activating at a given moment. And we could test this counterintuitive hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that, um, that when we 
partially recall a memory, it actually weakens it. And let's try and dig into what I mean by that. Um, so uh, this will be the only graph, I think, in the talk. So if this is how strongly the memory activates, that is say how easily or how vividly or how fully you're able to recollect the thing. And so in this case, let's say it's a memory you know really well, so it's highly active. Okay, as a result of having practiced recalling that and getting it blossoming into a full recollection, great, you will be more likely to remember it in future. In other words, you have done a little bit of positive learning on it. So far, so good? Okay. Please shout out if I'm being unclear. I'm happy to. Okay. Let's imagine that you haven't thought about the memory at all. In other words, it's like a control. Um, so you haven't forgotten it. Sorry, you haven't practiced it. You haven't not practiced you, You've just ignored it completely. Uh, then that has no effect, obviously. So the, 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 the uh, um, effect, if you try and remember it later, is the same as it would have been either way. Right? It hasn't changed. It hasn't become stronger. It hasn't become weaker. Here's the really interesting uh, proposal is that actually, if you partially activate a memory, that will actually make it less accessible. Let's say you've forgotten it a tiny bit. And so you could, th you could think about why this might be. Imagine you're the brain and you recall something. Well, it's obviously useful. But if you um, fail to recall it, then perhaps it wasn't useful. And so you should kind of sweep it under the rug so it doesn't get in the way in the future. You could almost imagine your brain as a kind of gladiatorial arena with lots of different memories competing to be activated. Um, where did I park my car this morning? OK, was it under the tree? Or was it like in that parking space near the bridge? Or, and you've got all these different memories activating. And the one that wins, oh, that's right. It was by the shop because I was going to run in and grab the so-and-so. OK, and that memory gets strengthened. All those other memories that got in the way but weren't helpful, weren't, weren't useful, your brain's like, oh, they weren't useful. Let's get rid of them so they don't get in the way next time. That's the intuition. Does that sort of make sense? OK. In other words, I guess what that means is if you want to um, build a learning platform that helps people to learn, you want to make sure that they are um, that the things you want them to learn are activating fully. That is, say, they're getting the answer right. They're able to remember. When they practice it, they get the answer right. Because what you want to avoid is that they, you test them, and they actually get the answer wrong, or they can't recall it, or they have a tip of the tongue, or they're blocked, because you're, if anything, hurting the memory. So it's a kind of weird, you know, like, oh, crikey. Um, but here's the tricky thing. You know, there's a sort of sweet spot where you want things to be difficult enough to be interesting, um, but not so difficult that, um, that you fail. And that, that difficulty sweet spot is, um, it, it is, where, is where you maximize the learning rate. So difficult enough to be interesting that your brain's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is good stuff. I want to make sure I get better at this. But not so tricky that you screw it up or get blocked or get the wrong answer because that will actually hurt the, the memory. And it you know, makes sense. It fits with our intuitive sense. It sort of fits with um, some of the models of, of flow that you, know, you want the optimal amount of challenge, uh, the, sort of the, the right level of difficulty. And um, I guess one of the thoughts that I had in working with Filtered, who um, I um, work with as an advisor, is that we talk a lot about recommendations uh, for learning. That is to say, hey, you might want to learn this next. We focus on relevance as a rule. That is to say, this is something, uh, it, it, it's good, and it's relevant to what you're trying to do. OK, well, that's obviously important. So that notion of personalization for relevance, totally clear. I guess what I'm trying to point out is that you also want to think about recommendations in terms of difficulty level. And so uh, one of the ways they deal with this is by having a really rich model of the seniority of the people, uh, the, 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 the learner. Uh, and also a rich model, a kind of ontology of skills, so that if the intern in the company and the CEO both are trying to learn about communication, they will get very different levels of difficulty or different kinds of material, right? And so just making sure that you are in that sweet spot um, feels uh, intuitively right, and it's something that a learning platform should be helping with. So let's talk just a little bit about um, motiva uh, motivation and engagement. 
so this is an image from Farmville. I don't know if you guys remember this. It was, at the time, the most popular Facebook game of all time. Um, it probably sort of single-handedly uh, sort of frittered away many millions and possibly billions of hours of human endeavor. Uh, we could have probably written like 15 Wikipedias uh, with the time that people spent playing Farmville. Uh, but a really interesting study in how to make something like honestly not very much fun, yet still very motivating through some combination of you know, social peer pressure because if I don't you know, water my farm, then you know, so-and-so won't get the corresponding reward, and like hijacking motivational psychology in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, so I think you know, modern learning platforms have a lot to learn from Farmville, because if you make something as honestly kind of boring as Farmville, totally addictive, then we should be able to do it for something intrinsically rewarding like learning. Um, and so I'll give two examples of how difficulty and motivation can intersect. There's obviously a million more things we could say about farm bill engagement and whatever. But let's just focus on this question of difficulty to keep it scoped. So lots and lot, we, we talk about gamification a lot. And gamification often seems to be a just sort of fancy word for, well, we added points and levels. Uh, and maybe high scores if you're feeling really fancy. Um, so let's, let's talk about, like, is that enough, and, 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 and what are the tricks of that? So if we talk about levels, so levels of difficulty, well done, you're on level 19. You're only 10,000 points away from getting to level 20. OK, so there is this sense of progression. Like, that's, that's intrinsically rewarding. OK. Um, and indeed, you can feel it's a way of titrating difficulty. OK. Um, it's a way of um, recognizing your success so you can brag about it. OK, these are all good things. If we focus, though, on the question of difficulty, uh, really masterful uh, gamification would involve, um, if you think about, like, if, if you're, if, I don't know if you've ever been on a long walk up a series of hills, um, there's that moment when you uh, uh, crest the hill and you're like, whew, and then you realize there's just another bigger hill just over there and you're like, oh, right? That is a sort of motivational trough. So when you go up a level, that's the moment when you need to make sure that the next few bits that you do are really easy because you're about to lose your, your users right then, right? So at the beginning of each level, make it nice and easy so that you don't lose people because they've, they've kind of achieved that, that last goal and they're kind of like, oh, the next level's so far away. Make it easy. Then you put your difficult stuff in the middle of the level. And then finally, when you're close to uh, getting getting to the, 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 the summit, then a little bit of make it easy again so that people feel like they're kind of running, they're kind of running up the last 100 yards, right? So there's a lot more, I suppose is all I'm trying to say, there's a lot more to the psychology of difficulty uh, uh, or difficulty and motivation inter intersect in really interesting ways. One last thing, by the way, it's very tempting to include high, school t high scores. Um, and if you do the experiments, um, then you can see as soon as you add high scores, then you will see an uplift in engagement. However, it's just one thing to note, actually you end up with two populations. There's a bunch of people who love the fact that there are high scores and it's really motivating. And there's a bunch of people who actually find it very demotivating, especially if you're not doing very well. Um, and um, one of the wisest pieces of advice I got given was, as soon as you put scores and high scores, someone will game it. And I remember the moment about three days after we added high scores when we found a YouTube video of someone who'd found a way of opening 100 um, browser tabs all with the same question and answering all of them in a row and then getting the same next question answering all of them in a row and like, had suddenly got like, literally 100 times more points than everybody else in the entire site and screwed up the whole motivational system. We had, I, don't know, I don't recall exactly what we did. I think we tried to send him an email asking him politely not to do it and realized that actually that wasn't going to scale. So I guess be careful about introducing any kind of currency or recognition or scoring because people will game it. Um, I think the second thing is the way that we ended up dealing with this issue of if you're just started and you're on like seven points and there's someone over there who's got a million, you're like, oh my God, there's just no way I'm ever going to catch up and you just kind of close the thing. So what we ended up doing was creating, in a sense, a custom high score table for every single user that included the 50 people uh, who had just joined before them and the 50 people who just joined afterwards. So that basically when you start, you're in the middle of your own personal high score table. And it therefore becomes much more tractable to sort of 
feel like, oh, actually, I think I could get to the top of this. Um, and there's always people who are below me. Um, anyway, so um, there's, there's sort of a whole bunch of stuff around difficulty and motivation to take into account. And indeed, if you think that um, how much we learn is a function of how quickly we learn and how long we spend at it, then um, efficacy and engagement both become critical. I was fixated on efficacy. I just want to make it the most effective way to learn in the world. But actually, at one point, it was very effective, but a lot of work. And so people didn't stick with it. And we realized, actually, that's no good either. So you've got to get the balance right. So I thought I would try switching modes. And uh, a little bit like those funny books where you get to sort of say, OK, if you swipe the head of the goblin, then turn to page 37, or if you take the goblin and you know, give him a kiss, then turn to page 95. Uh, I thought I'd try a choose your own adventure section of the talk, where I'll at least throw some potential topics we could discuss. And depending on what the interest is in one of them, then we'll go down that road. So are there any of these that feel like uh, they'd be of particular relevance to you? I guess we've done the top one. How to? Ah, how to praise. Thank you. Yes. Um, hands up if you've heard of Carol Dweck and mindset. OK, great. About half the room. All right. Um, so this is perhaps the most extraordinary uh, bit of psychology, real world psychology, I've come across in ages. Um, here's how it goes. The core idea that Carol Dweck had was that if you think of your ability at something as fixed or innate, then you'll be at a massive disadvantage compared to people who think of their ability as um, something like a muscle. If you practice it, if you work at it, you'll get stronger at it. On the face of it, that seems, I guess, you know, probably everyone's like nodding in their head. I think what's glorious about her work is that she showed in the lab nicely controlled studies that sure enough this is true. And then she took it into the real world and demonstrated it just unequivocally that not only was this true in the real world, but also it was a massive effect. I mean, it might be amongst the biggest single interventions that you can do. So for instance, if you take a bunch of eight-year-olds who are about to take a maths test, and um, some of them do better, some of them do worse, and afterwards, you say, to, you say to your nominated eight-year-old, um, well done. You did really well. You're really good at maths. Now, on the face of it, that's a positive feedback. You think you're doing a great job. Like, that seems like you are trying to help them and that it should be helping them. In practice, what you've actually done is you've said, well done. You're really good at maths. You're really clever. You have, in effect, implied a fixed, innate model. Well done, you're really good at maths. What that means is next week, if they don't do very well, what they're effectively going to be um, thinking is, oh, wait, maybe I'm not that clever. Maybe I'm not that good at maths. So you have accidentally, with all the best intentions in the world, created a fixed mindset. Whereas if what you say to them is, well done, you did really well, you must have worked very hard, then next time, if things go badly, as they always will at some point, the, the response is, maybe I didn't work hard enough. And this tends to just an enormous amount of emotional resilience, and the effects are incredibly striking. And so thinking in terms of your own inner voice about what you say to yourself when you do a good job or a bad job, and indeed what you say to others, it's, it, we, are, we, are, oh, we have a million opportunities a day to uh, remind ourselves and others that our abilities are, for the most part, something that we can improve at with effort and work and practice. Um, I guess I mention this. It's not just something about learning platforms. It's something about how we operate with each other, uh, how we learn and develop, and indeed what it means to incorporate continuous improvement into an organization, because uh, the kind of feedback we give to each other is uh, so much a part of that. Uh, so Carol Dweck. I think she has a book called Mindset. Um, I can also uh, share some links if anyone wants to hear more. She's all over the internet. Anything else jump out at you? Multiple learning styles. OK. I guess I have only a short uh, 
piece on this. So as you may know, Howard Gardner in the 1980s pioneered this idea of multiple learning styles. That is to say uh, that each person has a kind of uh, a preference uh, for a certain way of learning. You might uh, be a visual learner, in which case he'd argue that you would like uh, things to be presented in a visual way, or you might be an auditory learner or a kinesthetic learner. Um, and so there was this sort of long um, gestation where, uh, for instance, teachers would try and teach the same information through multiple styles to accommodate the different styles of their pupils. And so this person over here would draw something and that boy over there would sort of run around the table seven times to practice thinking about fractions. I don't know. Um, and uh, the intent was to accommodate these different learning styles. There's a lovely paper by Doug Rohrer where they do the right controlled study to determine really is this approach um, helpful? And um, basically they try and measure the learning styles of different pupils and then they try and match them versus a control group where they don't match them and see basically no effect. And it's a really nice clean paper that seems to utterly puncture the idea that accommodating people's different learning styles in the way that you teach leads to better learning outcomes. It does not seem to be borne out by the literature. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> that is a whole other talk. I think also one that I don't feel like I am qualified to have a strong opinion about. Or I'm, I'm mostly focusing on the news you can use angle. Um, I can just send you the paper and, and you can sort of, it, it, it's nice and easy to read. Um, Well, so we talked through some of the reasons, and the easiest is because we weren't paying attention in the first place. Fair enough. Um, I think uh, the second reason we gave was interference from other memories. So if you think about, uh, like a great example of when we forget things is, where did I park my car? Um, and you can imagine that there is enormous interference from every single other time when you drove to that car park, you know, at eight in the morning, wearing your suit, feeling slightly hungry and jaded or whatever. Like all of these factors are the same. So there's so many competing, interfering previous memories um, that it's not so much that we've forgotten as that we cannot target it, we cannot access it. And so um, if uh, we talked about with interference, try and find a different route to the memory or alternatively try and target it more precisely. So try and think, if you're trying to remember where you parked your car this morning, try and think, what did you have for breakfast beforehand? What were you wearing? What were you um, thinking about in the car? Um, because all of these help enrich the cue that you're using to try and trigger it. Likewise, you know, where did I leave my keys? Um, uh, uh, you know, what were you doing beforehand? Try and, try and um, so a policeman who, or police people who are doing um, interviews with um, victims of crimes, one of the ways to elicit as much richness of recollection is to try and really situate yourself, to rewind your state of mind to how it was when the thing happened uh, as much as you possibly can. Uh, other reasons why we forget things. So, the way that the brain stores memories uh, is a little bit like how the cast in a play remembers the play. So if you've got 10 actors and actresses who, are, um, who together know the play, that is to say, one of them starts off and then the second person knows their cue and the third person knows their cue, but no single actor or actress knows the entire play themselves, the memory is distributed over those 10 cast members. So far, so good? Neurons work a little bit like that. That is to say, there is no single neuron that knows, a, it, it, it's not helpful to think of this memory as residing in this neuron. It's much more helpful to think of a cast of neurons who, uh, across whom the memory is distributed. Okay. Of course, it's more complicated than that because uh, it's almost as though each neuron is a cast member in multiple memories, right? 
And so they're all, so all these memories are overlapping, and you know, each neuron is playing a, a role to a greater or lesser degree in lots of different memories. So what that means is that as you are learning new things, that neuron is kind of now being implicated in this, and its response is being tuned to helping it remember that and being cued by this. And that, in a, so in effect, you're kind of, um, you're pulling the neurons in multiple different directions every time you learn something, and those are, unless you're practicing the other memories too, those memories are degrading. In other words, th all the memories are kind of overlapping, and um, so learning new stuff kind of almost by definition means kind of pushing other stuff out the way. Um, so there's a sense in which forgetting is kind of bound up and intrinsically a part of learning. Of course, we can do lots to try and remind ourselves in useful ways so that we don't forget. But there's no way to learn without, in some sense, affecting what you already know. I suppose I'll say one more thing about dreaming, because it's totally bound up with this question of forgetting. The way the brain has dealt uh, The, the brain has to solve some pretty tricky problems. So if you get attacked by a tiger, then you want to be able to really vividly remember that. You don't want it to have to happen multiple times before you get the gist, right? OK. Um, at this, so, so the brain has a bit of uh, an area called the hippocampus. And it's really good at kind of taking a snapshot, a single memory, a snapshot, and storing it in great detail. There's a flip side, though. You'd think, oh, great, well, let's just remember everything. Well, actually, that's no help either, because um, we also need to see patterns in time. We need to be able to abstract over the 10,000 or 10 examples and see what's common to them, right? Um, otherwise, if all of my memories were simply high-fidelity, perfect snapshots, then I'd see, uh, I'd, I'd have seen Gare this morning, and then if I saw him tomorrow, and he was wearing a different uh, set of clothing or had a haircut, I wouldn't be able to recognize him, right? So that'd be no help at all. So I need to take lots of examples and sort of see what's common across them and store a kind of abstracted, summarized gist, OK? So you know, the posterior cortex is busily doing that. So we have these two learning systems that have different trade-offs, one that's really good at storing snapshots and one that's really good at seeing patterns over time. But but, but learns really slowly. So the way the brain solves that is by um, taking what happened over the course of the day, your hippocampus is loaded up with these snapshots, and then at night, it replays those snapshots over and over and over again, so that your really slow learning cortex can start to be like, wait, wait, show me that again? Oh, wait, wait, give me one more time, one more time. OK, and by the 15th repetition, it's like, OK, I, th I think I've got it now, right? But of course, we talked about how every learning is also an act of forgetting. And so what we need to do at the same time as replaying the new memories of the day to give the cortex a chance to internalize them, we also need to replay memories from the past to interleave them in order to make sure that we don't sort of accidentally overwrite everything that happened before with just today. So dreaming is, in effect, this act of replay of the snapshots from the day interwoven with uh, sort of stuff we already know from the past so that the two can kind of find a happy, harmonious, they can jostle against one another and f room for both. Um, fortunately, the brain does this already for us, so we don't need a learning technology to help us dream. But it does, I think, speak to this, this, the importance of reminders. And so I suppose the final thought that I would share around um, reminders and scheduling is if you run training for employees and they have a brilliant training workshop, that's great. But unless you find a way to remind them, ideally the next day, and then perhaps in a week, and then a month, and then a year, you are you're missing half of the potential for them right, really internalizing that. And I think you know, good instructors, good training, good, good systems will automatically do that. 
but it's just something to really bear in mind and to think about how to incorporate that. And ideally, it would be an active recollection rather than just sending them an email where they scan over and be like, oh, yeah, that all looks familiar. I just have one final question. Uh, does everybody know which door they would go through? <laughs> OK, good. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Greg. Very nice. There, is, uh, there are a few minutes left for questions, <laughs> remarks. Yeah. I'll come over. Greg, how do you balance the quantity and detail that one might learn in a course, whether that's an hour or an afternoon or a day, with the reflecting and learning on that through our dreams and interleaving it, and then reminders which are sufficient that they hit the sweet spot and not cause the problem we're trying to overcome? That's a real uh, active processed question that will be helpful for his learning process, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I was just thinking you definitely internalized almost everything I was trying to communicate. Um, so I spent you know, big chunks of a few years trying to algorithmically kind of optimize for that in, in a quite constrained set of circumstances around vocabulary and facts. I mean, if what we're talking about is richer, more kind of wisdom knowledge rather than facts knowledge. It's even harder, right? And even harder to measure. Um, so every learning platform is trying to do this in some shape or form. I think uh, rather than trying to answer it in terms of the algorithms, because that's a long, com yeah. I think in, as a human being, I suppose um, you can use your introspection, I suppose, is the short answer. So we, uh, when we uh, read something, or before you read something, if you try to actively recollect it beforehand, and then show yourself the answer, and sort of look at the discrepancy between what you knew and what else you'd missed or what you got wrong, and, and be really active in that kind of evaluation, how big a discrepancy was there, that gives you a pretty clear sense of how well you know it. OK, great. And at that point, you just have to use your sort of common sense to say, OK, actually, I think I pretty much nailed that. That's great. I probably don't need to, you know, I can, let, let's make sure I try something harder next time. Or, oh, that, I, I missed out a load of important stuff. I'd forgotten how much else there was to this, right? Um, maybe I'm going to need to actually double down on it. So I think it comes down to a sense of, um, like, being conscious and, and deliberative about that, um, about noticing and measuring that discrepancy for yourself and then acting in, in accordance. OK, who else? Nobody? OK. This, by the way, reminds yeah. me. Oh, sorry, <laughs> never mind. Um, can we completely uh, run out of space to remember everything? So can we learn too much? Um, so it's, a, it's a, a lovely but a tricky question for a few reasons. Um, so so a, a boring answer would be like our brain is finite. So almost certainly there is you know, a finitude to how much we can learn. Uh, but I think it would be sort of wrong-headed or simplistic to assume that it's a kind of one in, one out and that by learning more, we have pushed other stuff out. Um, I suppose part of the reason it's a tricky question is that we talk about memory as though it's unitary, as though there is you know, a single kind of memory. In practice, there are many kinds of memory. So for instance, um, uh, there's memory for thi Have I seen this before? Is this familiar? Can I recognize this as something that I've seen before? It's actually very easy to do. And even if we don't know something very well, we can still recognize it. There's a lovely experiment where they sat someone down for hours and showed them tens of thousands of paintings and then tested them afterwards. And they basically were completely perfectly accurate, even a week later, at answering the question, have I seen this before? 
So in some sense, it feels like our memory for have I seen it before is not quite, but might as well be infinite, right? Or it's certainly very large. However, it's much harder to say, OK, you know, uh, can you describe every painting you saw? Or indeed, here's part of a painting. What did the rest of it look like? In other words, to, fully, to, to, to fill in the details is a much harder memory test and a different kind of memory. Uh, and I think, um, you know, yes, it's definitely finite, but it's not that, uh, I think it's not that helpful to think of new knowledge as supplanting old knowledge. Um, with effective techniques and ways of learning, I think there's room for um, us to learn much, much more than we think we can. Um, and I suppose the final thought is that, in a way, learning is a kind of compression. When you really deeply understand something, it, kind of, it takes um, less space. So there's a brilliant illustration of this. Um, a bunch of psychologists put people in a, a relatively simple maze and let them wander around for like three minutes, which wasn't long enough for them to get the hang of it. Then they asked them to draw a picture of the maze as they thought it, and they were like, Whoa, and it was this really complicated thing. Actually, if you then give them more time in the maze, they realize, oh, wow, that's actually only you know, four corners. It's really pretty straightforward. And then you can suddenly you know, distill it down in a very, very kind of compressed way. In other words, we, the better we know something, the more compressed, the more we can summarize it, and therefore, in some sense, the more room there is for other stuff. Um, and that's, you know, o over time, with age, we, we learn these common patterns, um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of what wisdom is, and that allows us to keep on, you know, learning, because we don't have to store the details, we can just focus on the gist. And I think that's a very positive thing to end this uh, session with. Huh? <laughs> uh, one more time. Uh, round of applause for Greg. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you.